That phrase, I'm the lowest man on a totem pole, that's totally wrong because the bottom of the totem pole, or the first figure on the totem pole, that's where the story starts. All of the figures and designs on the totem pole are all important because the story starts on the bottom of the totem pole and goes up. Some of the RCMP uh, tells them where Julie lives. You go there, they invite you for supper or dinner or whatever, he said. And doctor, new doctors, they come all of a sudden. Julie, he said, they, they told me where you stay. That's how we meet you here, he said. So that's how we meet each other. My dad is 100, 107 years old. And my mom, 104 years old. And my grandpa, 115 years old. That's wow. where we got the story from. The student doctor, they come, they come over here and we feed, them, we cook for them and everything. And Dr. John help cooking. Oh, I'm going to tell a story in this one. Not too long, about over a month ago. Yeah. This is a big lake and the crow is screaming up there. And we say, I know why he's screaming up there. You see animals up there. And we took off to the main road. The moose looking at me, big horn there, ready to run, looking at me. I went over there and I, said, I shot him. Yeah, mom, you got him. Yeah, a little ditch, walk very slow on top, fall down. This is about two months ago. Anything I see, I shoot one, one shot. So now they call me one shot Julie. <laughs> No matter where I've gone, the people have been just the best. It's amplified in a place like Takla where you come. And not so long ago, um, we didn't have internet. Um, they didn't have phones. They used VHF radios. They didn't have electricity or running water. So those things came not that long ago in the, in the 1980s. How can we enhance the experience of people who live in a remote community like Takla? Um, with their healthcare journey. That's that's fundamentally what interests me. I have to start on the ride in um, because I think it's like it's like a Disneyland ride. Uh, you're in this small little plane, but you look out over the ocean, you see sort of all these green uh, forested islands sort of all scattered all over the place. And then as you come over the community, you can see the hospital, you can see the big house, you can see uh, the school, you can see these landmarks. Then when you land, it's always an exciting landing. It's always, in a, it's always an adventure uh, because they land by sight. The road is a forest service road, so you need Ideally, a one-ton truck to go on it and some serious tires. Uh, you need radios because uh, depending on what time of day you're driving, there could be a logging truck hurtling towards you. It's scary, it's time consuming. I do it once every two months, but for some people here, they might do it twice in a week. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a major barrier to health services, that's for sure. I was traveling for around 12 hours. That's how long it took me to get here. But that's not lost on me that the community has to travel the same amount to get to where they need to go if there's any emergency. So that's something that we have to go through, but they go through that in their everyday life. In my family's generation, there are three of us who were removed to attend these institutes elsewhere. My grandmother was five years old when she was removed, and my father was seven years old. I was 12, and before she died, I said to her mom, you know, do you remember when? She said, yeah, I do. I said, so how did, this is how I felt when I was on the, on the steamship. I was standing on the deck and watching the village get smaller and smaller. And pretty soon you were just a little dot. And then it dawned on me that I, I wouldn't see you. 
And I said to her, how did you feel? I said, I was really afraid. And she said, I didn't know who was going to take care of you. I didn't know where you were going. I didn't know when you'd be back. I didn't know if I'd see you again. And so she said, I had to stop, shut down a part of my maternal instincts because I knew that it would bother you. And, and she said, I just hoped you would be okay. And she was in school or in the Institute for two years. And so her literacy level for English was low. She didn't know how to write. So my younger sisters taught her how to write so she could write letters to me. It permeates what the community has been through, permeates everything uh, there, um, because it is almost impossible to not see the effects, um, for example, of the residential school system. It's not, it's impossible to see the effects of intergenerational trauma. The history of healthcare and the healthcare system falls well short of the mark for these communities because historically it's a very fragmented, reactionary, um, intermittent type of uh, interface between healthcare and people. And so doctors fly in, they fly out. What we wanted to do over 10 years ago was to really braid together in a thoughtful way technology with on the ground care so that we minimize or eliminated those gaps in access to care and we could continue providing care when we weren't physically here. So RTVS is real-time virtual support. It is a physician-to-physician -physician support uh, network. The Rudy Docs and these other ones that I'll talk about um, are not on call for anything else. They're on call for you, which is huge. So whenever I've called a specialist through RTVS, they're answering within one or two rings, for example, Charlie for pediatrics, and they answer almost immediately. Very different from when you have to call a hospital and speak to someone on call, go through switchboard, wait for a bit. Maybe they're dealing with something more urgent. So when I started, uh, we, um, it was pretty evident very, very quickly that uh, we were alone. Uh, the phones often didn't work. The electricity often didn't work. We didn't have internet. Um, and so you couldn't ask for help. Like you were totally on your own. You know, for, for us, we are really remote and it can be scary working there when you're with a sick patient and it's late at night and you know the planes aren't gonna fly. If somebody was to get into a car crash in Vancouver, you'd have probably eight different specialists tending to your care. Uh, here, you're lucky if you have one doctor and two nurses. I'm Wally Charlie. I grew up to be a medicine man at a young age. My role is to teach medicine in the bush. And I speak my language fluently. We live off the land. I had to stay in Prince George for eight and a half months. I had a broken neck a broken jaw, head injury and all that. But um, I went through all that and it's a pretty tough experience, but I'm glad to be okay. And the telehealth, that helps quite a bit. And I'm happy with my community that helped me out lots. Of course, I've seen anaphylaxis multiple times before, but I've never seen refractory anaphylaxis. It's 
pretty rare. Uh, and I've never been in a situation where we had to intubate someone who was having airway compromise. So having swelling in the throat, making it a difficult airway, all of the airways that I had encountered up until that point had been in the safety net of the OR. So this situation was completely novel for me. And what we were able to do is have a doctor from Rudy there. They were looking, I was using a glide scope, so they were looking at the screen that I was looking at. And based on what they saw on the screen, they told me how to move my hand so that I was able to get the tube uh, into the trachea. It's particularly helpful for trauma situations where there are, things are critical and sen time sensitive and that you don't have time to um, you know, uh, think about these things because it's a quite a stressful thing. And these guys do this every day. You know, this is their bread and butter work. So it's really nice to have their perspective when you can. With this, it's it's immediate, right? You get the call, the person's already there and it's, and, and, and all of a sudden you're totally in the mix of it. It just, it's instant. Um, and I think that is, that is different call I got yesterday uh, was about a young woman who had um, been assaulted uh, by an intimate partner and a uh, new nurse I'd, had not been to the community before. What I've learned in these situations is there's the way that we often think about it is that like, you know, you have somebody who's sick, they need to have a test done and you need to send them there and they get it done. But it's a lot more complex than that. Uh, so yes, sometimes you know we'll support people to go somewhere else to get a test done, but but um, supporting the person who's calling together that we can look at what is the social circumstance, what's the risk and benefit of going out, what's the risk and benefit of staying, uh, what time of year is it, is it going to be dark in three hours, you know all those and so we'll have those like that's the discussions we'll we'll have. Knowing that that's available, just knowing whether you use it or not. Just knowing it's there, massive difference. Our traditional way of learning is audiovisual. So it's a natural way for us to be able to hear and to see and to interact that way. And indeed, in Bella Bella, there is some virtual support that way. And I've taken my mother and I knew that she would be a really good test case. And so she was speaking to a doctor through, uh, on TV and she was intrigued. But she didn't feel threatened because physically he wasn't there. So she didn't feel that sort of physical kind of mm, barrier to overcome in context of... Th but she also really enjoyed being able just to communicate with someone that um, was far away, you know. So I knew that if she enjoyed it, then it, it certainly has possibilities and it's certainly an alternative to some of the quality of care that's needed. So I am a born and raised Nation member and uh, the only reason I had to leave community was because I had children. And so when I left community was to raise my children and I always had a goal to come back home once my kids were adults and, and so now I'm here. There was a patient there who went into labor. It was a rainstorm. Um, it was hot. They started going into precipitous labor around 2 p.m. We were calling to get them transferred out of there. You know, within three hours, we knew that this was going to be happening in the next few hours, and we also knew that nothing was coming <laughs> to bring her in those next few hours. So we better find a way to help her deliver her baby because um, no one had had a baby there, and you know probably a good decade or something like that. But because it's real medicine, you really have to be prepared for anything. So I hadn't done any significant obstetrical work since residency, but I was able to get um, someone from Mabel from RTVS on the line. In this context, probably the worst case scenario would be a postpartum hemorrhage. So rather than wait for that to happen, we talked that through and I was very confident that if that were to happen, I would know what my steps were. I can just imagine how tremendous it would be to have a baby born in our own health clinic here, for this baby to be welcomed not only by their extended family, their immediate family, but our 
community, our hereditary chiefs, and the first thing that will happen when that baby leaves the clinic is they get introduced back to Mother Earth. Just welcome this baby in the fresh air, the elements, in culture, in ceremony. Just wrap it, <laughs> sorry. It would just be beautiful and so meaningful. You know, you, we talk about culturally safe care and you're like, okay, so I'm a carrier, just like these people here. Uh, I'm, I'm a physician, you know, and they're gonna come. And so when he first came, I remember in, uh, in Yakuchi, I think I had like two people that whole day and I was like, what's going on here? And then you see Dr. John a couple of weeks before and he had like 20, 30 patients or something. I'm like, am I doing something wrong here? And, but you know, it's just building those relationships, you know, in that time and having conversations and building their trust, you know, because if they, if they, if they feel comfortable, they're going to come see you. And, and if they don't, they're, they're not going to. Developing that relationship with the community really transcends this physical building and providing, you know, doing doctor stuff in a healthcare setting. But arguably the most important stuff I do is out there in, in the community. And so throughout the years, uh, you know, I've come with myself, with colleagues, with peers, with students, some medical students, some residents, and the rich engagement of uh, human behavior that extends from the health center into the community has been really intentional. And so uh, whether we're out in the lake uh, doing an activity like setting a net or going off to berry pick or just going for a boat ride or going to check a trap line or going up to Hogum and going to some traditional territory. Um, that's all really, that's just essential um, activity to help deepen the relationship between all of us. You have to love yourself in order to trust another person. If another person don't trust you, then you can, I can feel it just like a magnet. Well, every Dr. John comes in and different doctor comes in, I, I feel that, like they're here to help out people. We just have to trust them. People care about me and, you know, they're happy to see me. And, uh, you know, I, 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 a man that I took care of for many years recently passed away. And, you know, he, he and his wife would call me son. And it wasn't, you know, I mean, it was, there was some sarcasm to that, but there was also sort of, you know, compassion and love there. And, and so, yeah, I, it's, um, I almost always come away with, you know, more than I left. The history of abandonment is so great that we just are always on alert. You know, how long is this going to be? How long are you staying? How long are you here for? What would happen if RTVS disappeared? I think that that's such an important part of this work is continuity. Because I think that very often the way that government, for example, works with First Nations co communities is that they'll do two year programs or three year programs and that maybe something really nice is developed from that and that the funding and consequently the program goes away. And you can't, people can't build on that. You can't. Um, you can't advance on that if you can't trust that this platform that you're using to build your community is going to still be there. It really makes it hard to to grow and to advance as a community. RTVS uh, uh, is essential now. Once you once you've been given something, it's really hard for it to be even thought of being taken away. And uh, you know, I, I am very thankful every time I go to it that it's there. And I, because of how much of a difference it makes, uh, it helps me have the, have the confidence I need to do my job in such a way that I know that I'm providing the best care that I can. As we travel around the province and listen to the stories and see the data roll in, um, you know, it, it's very clear what's happening here. There's a culture change and um, we're supporting all these nurses stations like you see in TACLA 24-7, uh, unconditional support, no strings attached. Here we are, five minutes, five hours, we're, we're here. It feels really good to see um, that there's someone that they can call. Uh, and uh, 
I, you know, I feel like a lot of the, some of the trauma that I hold is because I, I didn't have somebody to call. Um, and so it's, it's actually, yeah, it's kind of exciting to see that that is there and that I get to be a part of that. To be a, a, a healthcare provider, whether it's urban or rural, but to have the ability to know that there's a trusted team that's reliable that you can access in such an easy way for anything, whether it's a question or uh, or a, a case that's really challenging, um, that that is truly priceless. I've got a nephew who is at the age of 13 is already an excellent little mariner, you know? And I have a granddaughter who knows how to pick seaweed now and knows how to prepare it. And those same children will learn the skills that we were deprived of. And with that learning, they'll become stronger that gives me hope.